Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We will get started in about two minutes. Please do feel free as you're hopping on to introduce yourself in the chat box. There are hundreds and hundreds of people registered for the webinar today. Um, if you'd like to say hello to the entire community gathered here, be sure to select um, everyone in the drop down menu just above the chat. It's really good to see so many people here. Excellent geographic representation in the chat. Welcome to everyone. If you're just joining, we will get started in another minute. Great. Okay, we will get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Bevan Croft. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a white woman. I have long blonde hair and I'm in a pretty colorful home office. Uh, I co-direct the National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Systems. And I'm very happy to welcome you all here to our March webinar, Understanding and Addressing Unmet Needs in Home and Community-Based Services, or HCBS, Through the Lens of Person-Centered Practices. So I will go through a few uh, just opening remarks, housekeeping, and then I'll turn things over to our speakers for the day. Um, we are, are pleased to be doing this webinar. It's the first time we have done a webinar that's really featuring a research study. Um, and we chose this research study because it's very much um, focused on a topic that we care deeply about, um, which is the association uh, between unmet needs for home and community-based services and outcomes. And it uses methods that are very person-centered because the outcomes um, that this study is exploring are person-reported outcomes. Um, there have been other studies that have looked at um, you know, hospitalization and medical problems, but this is the first study that really um, explores outcomes from the perspective of, of people who use home and community-based services. Um, and the study was conducted by our friends at Brandeis University. Um, and we have uh, folks from Brandeis here um, and, uh, and also uh, one of our person-centered advisory leadership group members uh, to share their perspectives uh, on this incredibly important topic. Topic. Uh, we are grateful to be funded uh, to do these webinars by the Administration for Community Living and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And just a note here that any opinions shared during this presentation are not the opinions of the Administration for Community Living or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Next slide has a few more logistic uh, logistics. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> In case you are unfamiliar with NCAPS, the National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Systems, we are a federal center housed at the Human Services Research Institute. Um, and our goal as a center is to promote systems change that makes these principles of person-centered thinking, planning, and practice, not just aspirational, but a concrete reality 
in the lives of people um, across the lifespan throughout the country. Um, so on the next slide, we have some logistics. This is a webinar format, so you will not be able to use, um, you know, to, to ask questions verbally during this webinar, but we very much encourage you to engage with us on chat and many, uh, many folks are already doing so. Oh, hello in Guam. Um, and uh, please do uh, use chat um, and feel free to post questions there. I will be monitoring chat throughout the presentation. Um, and towards the end, there will be uh, hopefully some ample time for, um, for discussion. Um, also feel free to respond to each other, et cetera. And if you are using chat and you want everyone to see your question, please be sure to select everyone in the drop down menu. If you leave it as is, it will just go to uh, myself and the hosts and panelists. Um, this webinar is um, captioned in English and Spanish. And to access the Spanish captions, there is a link um, that you can find in chat. You will need to toggle to select Spanish uh, if you would like the Spanish uh, captioning. Um, there are also a couple of polls that we will be pulling up. So be prepared, please, to interact during those times. Um, after this webinar, um, we will post the slides and the recording and any additional materials on our website. Um, and um, you are more than welcome to be in touch with us uh, if you'd like to join our mailing list, if you have any feedback for us on this webinar, if you have ideas for future webinars, um, and our email address is on the next slide. It's ncaps at hsri.org. If you could go to the next slide, please, Elaine. Thank you. All right. Um, Yes, and if you would like to download a copy of the slides today, you can also find that link in chat. So please scroll, scroll through and Sashka, who's our uh, handling um, uh, the tech uh, for this webinar will be dropping those links periodically into chat. So if you don't see them when you scroll up, um, Sashka will put those in periodically. You're welcome to download a PDF of the, these slides uh, now if, you, if you'd like to do that. All right, so let's do our first poll. I'd love to know who is joining us today. Um, this is a select all that apply question. So please, uh, the poll should pop up and go ahead and select uh, what roles you self-identify in. So that could be a person who uses um, long-term services and supports, a person with a disability, a family member or loved one of a person who uses long-term services and supports, a self-advocate or an advocate, peer specialist or peer mentor, if you're a social worker, counselor, um, or care manager, a researcher or analyst, uh, if you belong to or provide services through a community or faith-based uh, provider, um, or if you are a government employee, recognizing that, of course, these uh, roles are not mutually exclusive. So we will leave this poll up until I see the, the numbers start to slow down. There's over 500 of us on today, so I want to make sure anyone who wants to complete the poll has a chance. Okay. Well, oh, folks are still going. All right. Okay, so we can, sh yeah, we can share the results here. Um, great. I see a plurality of you uh, self-identify as social workers, counselors, or care managers, um, and a lot of folks from um, uh, who are government employees, a lot of provider employees. Welcome to the thirty-five re researchers and analysts today. Uh, 19 peer specialists, peer mentors, 67 self-advocates, 77 family members, and 20 people who self-identify as having a disability or using long-term services and supports. Welcome to all. Um, so, oops. Um, so next I will introduce our panelists today. Um, we have two panelists with us now, and we hope that we will be joined by a third who um, 
has had um, some things come up. Um, so on the next slide, um, I, will, I will share, if you could move to the next slide, please, Elaine. Um, really pleased to have um, a, a panel here. The first person you'll hear present is Natalie Chong. Natalie is a doctoral candidate at Brandeis University's Heller School for Social Policy and Management. She studies health policy and health services research, and her interests include aging and health policy issues that impact older adults. Um, and Natalie is also uh, part of a research team at the Lurie Institute on Disability, uh, researching quality and outcomes of home and community-based services for people with disabilities. Uh, Finn Garner uh, will hopefully join us today. Uh, Finn's a disability rights advocate with interest in educational equity, intersectional justice, comparative policy, and inclusive technology. Um, and Finn is the communications specialist at the Lurie Institute for Disability Policy at Brandeis University. And we also have uh, Jennifer Brown. Uh, Jennifer founded the IROS group in 2017, and that group has the mission of bringing people back to the center of planning so that they can create lives where the focus is on their hopes and dreams. Uh, Jennifer's group, IRO, specializes in supports brokerage, uh, which is a waiver service uh, in New Jersey for people uh, to help them self-direct their services and supports um, and connecting them to their communities. And she's been serving people with disabilities in the state of New Jersey for 20 years. So welcome uh, to all. And Natalie, I will turn things over to you to share the results of uh, your very important study. Thank you, Bevan. Can you all see me? Yep, we can see. There you. we go. All right. Thank you, Bevan. It's good to be with you all today. Um, again, I'm Natalie Chong, and I am affiliated with the Lurie Institute at Brandeis University. Today, I'll be presenting a study that my colleagues and I recently published. Before I start, I want to just briefly describe what I look like. Um, I'm an Asian woman with short black hair. I'm wearing glasses and a light purple sweater. Uh, behind me is a brown bookshelf. And because everyone shared uh, where they are located right now, um, I'd like to share that I'm presenting from Massachusetts. The paper I'll be discussing today is titled The Relationship Between Unmet Need for Home and Community-Based Services and Health and Community Living Outcomes. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors who are listed on this slide. And I'd also like to acknowledge our funding source, which was NIDLER, the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. Um, after I present, I will post a link to the article that um, I will be presenting today, and also a brief um, that the co our co-panelist Finn produced, which summarizes our article as well. Next slide, please. All right, before I dive into the details of our study, I wanted to briefly give some background on our study motivation. As most of you probably already are familiar, um, but for those who aren't, I'd like to give a brief overview of um, home and community-based services, also known as HCBS. So HCBS refers to a wide range of health and social services that are provided to individuals with disability who may need assistance with everyday activities. These services are integral to helping users live independently in the community. And while HCBS is not medical care, these services do support users' health and well being. So while looking at the literature on HCBS quality and sufficiency, there are a few key research gaps that our um, study team identified. These gaps are um, a lack of data for multiple states and Medicaid programs. A um, few studies that use user reported information and perspectives in their studies. Also samples that focus on adults with all ages as opposed to certain age groups such as just older adults. And finally, um, there's a lack of studies that relate um, HCBS quality to key user outcomes. Next slide, please. So to address these gaps, our study focuses on two overarching research questions. The first research question is, 
what is the prevalence of unmet need for home and community-based services? The second question is, what is the association between these unmet needs for HCBS and key health and community living outcomes? And this is among the Medicaid HCBS population. Next slide, please. So uh, we used the National Core Indicators Aging and Disability Survey as our data source for this study. Um, this is also known as the NCIAD survey. So the NCIAD targets older adults and adults with physical disabilities who receive publicly funded LTSS. The NCIAD survey collects consumer reported information about user experiences and outcomes across over 50 indicators or measures that cover topics like care coordination, access to care, community participation, healthcare, and safety. This crucial information gives feedback to states so that they can measure and improve the quality of their LTSS systems. States voluntarily participate in the NCIAD survey and these surveys are fielded by state agencies in collaboration with the NCIAD survey team. Finally, the survey is administered to users through an in-person interview. The vast majority of questions are collected um, based on responses from the HCVS user themselves, but some questions allow for proxy respondents. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you all um, a little bit more insight into how the NCIAD survey is sampled or the participants are sampled. So first, state agencies volunteer to participate in the NCIAD survey. Second, states select the specific LTSS programs in their state that they want to sample from. Third, the NCIAD project team advises and tracks each state's program selection and sampling approach. States must have at least 400 individuals responding to their surveys, despite the fact that each state will have their own unique survey responses and sample sizes. Finally, I would like to note that states have the option to, be, uh, to also participate in several optional modules. So for example, in the most recent um, NCIAD survey round, there was a optional module on person-centered planning. Next slide, please. All right, so this slide uh, lists all of the states that participated in the 2017-2018 cycle of the NCIAD survey. The states are listed on the left side of the screen and on the right side of the screen is a map of, this, of the United States. And the states that participated in this survey are highlighted in green color. Next slide, please. So that was a brief overview of the NCIAD survey itself. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions uh, related to the survey um, later on. Um, and now I'm gonna transition into focusing on our specific study. So for our study, we limited our sample in several ways. First, we limited our sample to include individuals who received HCBS through a state Medicaid program. Second, we also uh, subsetted our sample to focus on individuals who were residing in the community at the time of the survey. In all, we have 13 states represented in the data. And this, the data we had was de-identified at the state level, meaning that while we knew which states were included in the data, we did not know which responses were associated with each specific state. I'd also like to note that we were unable to obtain data for three of the states, which is why we have 13 out of the 16 states represented. Our final sample size, for the study was at about uh, 10,000 respondents. Next slide, please. All right. 
So this slide provides an overview of the key independent variables that we examined in our study. Our key independent variables were a set of indicators for unmet need measured across five different domains. The first domain um, was unmet need for assistance with self-care or other daily activities. The second domain was unmet need for services that met user needs and goals. The third domain was unmet need for assistive technology. And within the assistive technology uh, domain, respondents were asked specifically about each of the following um, items, a walker, scooter, wheelchair, hearing aids, glasses, and CPAP machine. The fourth domain was uh, unmet need for home modifications. Home modifications included bathroom grab bars, other bathroom modifications, specialized bed, ramp or chairlift, remote monitoring system, and an emergency response system. Finally, the fifth domain focused on unmet need for transportation. And this included transportation to medical appointments and also for leisure in general. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to provide a closer look at how um, exactly unmet need was assessed given the data produced by NCIAD. So um, there are two general ways that unmet need was assessed. For the unmet need domains of assistance with self-care or daily activities, unmet need for services that met user needs and goals, and unmet need for transportation, uh, users were simply asked a question, do you always get enough blank when you need it? So in this example that I have displayed on the slide, um, it's related to assistance for daily activities. The question reads, do you always get enough assistance with your everyday activities when you need it? If respondents indicate no, not always, or sometimes, they are coded as having unmet need for the corresponding domain. Next slide, please. The second way that unmet need is assessed in this study uh, relates to unmet need for assistive technology and home modifications. So as described earlier, within each of these domains, there are six equipment items or types of items um, that are asked about. Uh, for each equipment, respondents are asked whether or not they need, have, but need an upgrade, has but doesn't need an upgrade, or does not need each type of equipment. If a respondent indicates that, the per that they need or have but needs an upgrade for any type of equipment, they are coded as having an unmet need in that domain. Next slide, please. Um, our outcome variables focused on two general categories. The first was um, a set of health outcomes. So there are four health outcomes we looked at. The first was emergency room visits. Second was hospital or rehab stays. Third was a physical, also known as a wellness exam. And fourth was a dental exam. For each of these items, respondents were asked whether or not any of these events occurred with a look back period of 12 months. And for these health items, the survey allowed proxies to respond on behalf of the respondent. Now on the right side of the slide um, is listed the set of community living outcomes that we looked at in our study. The first was whether or not the respondent was active in the community, whether or not, the second was whether or not they interacted with friends and family, the third, was whether or not they were satisfied with how their time spent during the day. And finally, the fourth one is whether or not they felt in control of their life. Now, each of these questions were framed as desired. So for example, the respondent was asked, do you, are you as active in the community as you desire? 
And for these community living outcomes, proxy respondents were not allowed to report on behalf of the respondent. Next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of the methods or the types of analyses we did in our study. So first, we conducted some descriptive analysis that was followed by some multivariate analysis to examine the association between unmet need across the different domains and our health and community living outcomes. Um, just some technical details. Uh, we use multivariate logistic regressions um, and each model included only one outcome. So there was one model per outcome. All unmet need variables and all outcomes were coded as binary um, variables, meaning they were coded as either yes or no. And third, we estimated adjusted odds ratios using 95% confidence intervals to, um, in our models. At the bottom of the slide, um, I list several covariates, also known as co control variables, that we looked at in our multivariate analysis. Um, I grouped these by domain. So under demographics, we have age, gender, race, ethnicity. And for race, ethnicity, we grouped uh, respondents into several categories. This included white, non-Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, Hispanic or Latino, and unknown. The second domain of control variables um, I called health and function. Um, so some of these variables included what the degree to which the respondent needed help with self-care activities, the degree to which the respondent needed help with other daily activities, and the self-reported health status. Finally, we included some other control variables. These included residence type, um, and residence type was grouped as follows, home and senior living versus congregate setting versus other, whether or not the respondent lived alone, and finally, whether or not the respondent lived in a rural or urban area. And this was determined based on zip codes that were grouped into the uh, federal RUCA categories. Next slide, please. All right, so here we uh, begin our, our results. So on this first slide, uh, which is one of two slides that describe our key descriptives, or key descriptive findings, on the right-hand side is a tape, sorry, excuse me, on the left-hand side is a table that lists the prevalence of each of the five um, unmet dean domains. Um, as you can see, um, the most common type of unmet need across these five domains was unmet need for assistive technology, followed closely by home unmet need for home modifications. And in both of these domains, over 50% of respondents reported unmet need in these areas. On the right-hand side of the slide is a pie chart. Um, the pie chart uh, displays the prevalence of unmet need in at least one of the five domains. In the red chunk of the pie chart, um, you can see that 19% of the sample reported having no unmet need in any of these five domains. In the dark blue section of the pie chart, uh, we report that 81% of the sample had unmet need in at least one of these five categories. Next slide, please. Um, our next slide, sorry, excuse me. This slide um, presents uh, key descriptive findings um, on some of the respondent characteristics that were related to unmet need. So respondents who had any unmet need versus respondents who reported no unmet need were more likely to be younger in age, non-white, live at home or in senior living, live alone, and report having poor health status. Next slide, please. 
This is this third slide that summarizes our key descriptive findings. Um, I will briefly orient you all to what is, um, what is displayed in this figure. So this is a bar chart. Um, each of the outcomes that we looked at, there are eight in total, are listed at the bottom of the bar chart. And for each outcome, there are two columns. The dark orange column represents individuals who reported at least uh, one type of unmet need. And then the light orange column presents individuals who had no unmet need. So what this uh, figure summarizes is the prevalence of um, the various health and community living outcomes by unmet need status. To briefly summarize the takeaways, individuals with at least one type of unmet need had greater prevalence of ER use and overnight hospital or rehab stays. Individuals with no unmet need were more likely to receive both types of preventative care services that we examined in the study. These were the physical exam and the dental exam. Finally, with respect to community living, users with no unmet need were consistently more likely to experience each of the positive community living outcomes. Next slide, please. Next, I'll be presenting some of the key findings from our multivariate analysis. First, I'm going to give a broad overview, and then I'll detail a bit more on the specific types of unmet needs and the relationships to the various outcomes. After adjusting for key user characteristics, unmet need was consistently associated with the following. Greater likelihood of an ER visit and a hospital or rehab stay, reduced likelihood of receiving both types of preventative care, and finally, lower likelihood of experiencing each of the community living outcomes. Next slide, please. Here, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit um, and focus on the health outcomes and their relationship to unmet need. So comparing across the different types of unmet need, those were the five uh, unmet need indicators. Unmet need for assistive technology was associated with the greatest likelihood of having an ER visit and a hospital or rehab stay, as well as the lowest likelihood of having a physical exam. This is in comparison to all of the other unmet need indicators. Unmet need for transportation was associated with the lowest likelihood of having a dental exam. Next slide, please. Now this slide does the same thing, but now we focus on unmet need and the community living outcomes. So comparing across the, di the different types of unmet need, unmet need for transportation was associated with the lowest likelihood of being active in the community and interacting with friends and family. Unmet need for services that fully met recipient needs and goals was associated with the lowest likelihood of both satisfaction with how the respondent spent their time and also feeling in control of their life. Next slide, please. As I wrap up my presentation, I wanted to note some of our study's limitations as well as strengths. The first limitation of our study is that our sample was not a representative sample of all US HCBS recipients in the, in the country. Second, um, because of the limitations with our data, we cannot control for any cross-state differences and variations between the programs that were included in the survey. Participating states did not have identical sampling strategies, and they also selected respondents from their own set of unique Medicaid HCBS programs, each using their own eligibility requirements to be included in the sample. Therefore, the study sample may not be representative of the Medicaid HCBS user population within each state or across all states. 
The third limitation um, is related to the cross-sectional design of this survey. So the survey was a snapshot in time. Um, we do not currently have um, temporal data to look at because states um, do not sample identical populations year to year. And also the states that participate in NCIAD vary from year to year. The fourth point here is more um, conceptual, um, which is that um, depending on how you look at things, we don't know if the healthcare utilization outcomes we looked at are necessarily preventable through high quality HCBS services. Um, utilization of healthcare services can sometimes be a positive thing when you're looking at it from the perspective of access to certain medical services. Finally, I wanted to note some of the strengths of our study. Our study provides a first look at the NCIAD data beyond the NCIAD annual reports. NCIAD produces really in-depth reports each year on the results of their survey, which I encourage you all to take a look at. However, our study takes things a step further by looking at the relationship between HCBS quality and key user outcomes. The second strength I wanted to highlight is that our study provides a multi-state picture of experiences of HGBS recipients. This study moves beyond looking at HGBS quality in a single state or in a single waiver program, for example. Third and finally is our, the richness of user reported data. As Bevan mentioned earlier, the NCIAD data really does provide a gold mine of data in terms of um, the personal experiences of users of HCBS, and it provides a firsthand account of LTSS quality. Thank you all for listening to my presentation, and now I'd like to hand it off to Jennifer. Hello, here we go. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. That was um, a really imp important research. I find it, um, been reading it, your research and over the past couple of weeks in preparation. And I'm, I'm really glad that there's people out there like you doing the research that you're doing. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Bevan and uh, Alex for asking me to be on this webinar. Um, I, I really, I've taken this very seriously um, and I hope that I can provide some perspective. Um, this is, my perspective is just in New Jersey. I don't have um, the national um, perspective. Um, and I also don't have, um, I only have the perspective of one uh, service system and that is the service system used in New Jersey for the Division of Development of Disabilities. So having said that, let's get started. <laughs> um, I find in, unmet needs in, in, in the service system, that there's a, a conflict, um, that, that the conflict is between, um, it's, it's using person-centered planning to primarily plan for services. Person-centered planning is, an, is at the base, and when it's done well, it's not based on a system or availability of services. Home and community-based services that are administered through the state system use a medical model and are deficit-based. You have to have a disability and that disability has to impact your life in such a way to require supports. And there is an assessment to determine the level of support a person receives. Person-centered planning is a service model that helps recipient make decisions about the services they use based on their needs, values, goals, and preferences. And this is the way that um, it, is, it is being used in, um, in, in planning for services. True person-centered thinking and planning are used to help a person discover their gifts and plan their life. It's meant to define hopes and dreams, what is important to a person and what's important for a person. Um, once we have this information, we do a deeper dive before we connect them to the service system. In reality, what happens is the service system is using the assessment tool that determines eligibility to build the service plan. 
Next slide. So before I get started on the next slide, I did forget to do something. Um, I am um, Jennifer Brown. I am from New Jersey. I'm, uh, I, I have a um, company called Eros Group. Um, I'm in my office right now today. I have a blue, light blue, baby blue sweater set on. Uh, my grandmother's um, a locket. I have white hair and I'm a white woman. So I apologize for not doing that sooner. So the, there are some service system limits um, that are just inherent in service systems. I always say you, you can't get a good life from a service system. The service system, it provides, it provides for support, but it can't provide for relationships. It can provide the needed physical assistance to a person, such as feeding, feeding and bathing, toileting, medication, communication assistance, but not to create the places and spaces where a person can show up and share their gifts. Person-centered thinking and planning through discovering hopes and dreams is about relationships and building community. Again, using a person-centered tools first and the service system second, we are more likely to create the spaces needed, to, um, so the spaces needed and also to build relationships. These are some of the things that outlast the service system. They, those are the, when you actually make a connection in the, in the world with another person, that's gonna outlast a service system. Service and supports maintain a physical body, connections and relationships support the soul. People mistakenly think that, th that people with disabilities are safest when they're in service systems and people with robust circles of support ties to their community where they're seen for their gifts and are integral, integral members of the community actually have better outcomes. Next slide. Okay. So again, this is my perspective in New Jersey, um, and this is not meant, um, I know that um, uh, across the nation that, that each state is different. Um, so please um, just understand that this is the experience as I see it in New Jersey. So our system in New Jersey is difficult to learn and understand how to get your needs met. There's multiple service systems that you need to learn their vocabulary and lexicon. Um, and it's also vitally important to understand how they interact. So we have service systems for housing, for transportation, for employment. Uh, we also need uh, the local social services to help with things like supplemental nutrition assistance program, energy assistance, um, universal service fund, which helps with electric bills, things like that. Um, then we have social security and Medicaid. Um, social security is federal, Medicaid is federal as well, but it's administered on the state level and then again on the county level. So understanding how all these things interact and how one will impact the other. So in New Jersey, if you don't have Medicaid, um, you're not able to get services. Um, that's an important um, thing to know and you need to know what you need to do to, in order to keep your Medicaid and how that impacts your employment um, and kind of on from there. Our manual in New Jersey is, it's over 230 pages. Um, it is searchable, so it is, we do have that feature, um, but it is, it, is, it is a read, it is a difficult read. Our budgets um, may be on the large side, but the money is siloed. So there's, we call them different buckets and the buckets, um, each bucket has to be, it's a specific reason that you're using that bucket. If there's a service that you need and you don't, you've run out of money in that bucket, you can't really take from the next bucket. It's also, the service system is also dependent on really strong natural supports. So if you don't have strong natural supports, you may not get what you need. And that's, that's tough because you have the, the ability to navigate the service systems it, um, without which people struggle to obtain and maximize the various types of support that may be available. You don't know what you don't know. And so there's a lot of um, networking that needs to be done and coordination um, across services. Next slide. So in New Jersey, when you have a, um, a service that you've asked for um, to be paid for through your budget and um, that service is denied, um, you have to um, make a, um, a, a request for a fair hearing. And that process begins with the filing of the, the request form. Um, you must file it within 20 days of, it, of the receipt of the denial um, or the denial will be permanent. Um, it's, fired, it's filed with the um, fair hearing unit of the New Jersey Division of Men Medical and Health Services. Um, and once this is done, the unit, the, they set a date for a place for the hearing. 
The hearing is held by administrative law judge. It is a trial and both sides um, will be able to present evidence. And the argument, the um, evidence has to be um, based on the Medicaid regulations. Um, it's really um, recommended to have um, legal representation, um, which is, is sometimes difficult for people to um, acquire and pay for. Uh, once the hearing is um, completed, the administrative law judge writes the um, decision, which is then distributed to all parties. Um, the, the director of the Division of Medical and um, Health Services um, can either approve it or reverse it. So it is kind of a recommendation. It's not really like a ruling that's um, steadfast. So um, when it gets to the director, he can, um, he or she can reverse. Um, and when you, if you want to appeal that decision, then you have to take that to the appellate division um, or in some cases, um, federal court. So you can see really where um, it is an arduous process and it's, um, it can take some time. Um, some appeals have taken two years, um, some take four months. So, um, but having said that, um, you know, the system's hard, it's, it's uh, difficult to navigate sometimes. It's, um, it's not always, you know, the money, the funding's, uh, funding's there, but it's not always able to be used in the ways that you want to use it. Um, and um, you also need really good natural supports to, to be able to, um, to, to, to make sure that you're getting what you need. Um, so those are kinds of the, the, the downsides of things in a general sense, but there is some good news. Um, next slide. So um, in New Jersey, um, in 2017, a law was passed that created an ombudsman for the individuals with intellectual development and disabilities in their families. Um, and this has been truly, um, this really has changed our, our, our system. Um, the legislation creating the offices outlines um, the specific, his specific, their specific responsibilities, um, which are assisting individuals and families to navigate New Jersey system of care to get the services and supports they need and deserve, working with the families and individuals to identify opportunities to improve the system and helping to ensure that the voice and is heard in a meaningful way and that the decisions that directly affect them um, as well as larger um, policy decisions. So as you can see, this, this office was created and it's um, it, the ombudsman reports directly into our governor. Um, so there's no layers of um, bureaucracy between him and the, and the governor and decisions are, um, you know, we, it's, it's, a, it's a pipeline to, to get things done um, a little bit quicker. Um, every year the office produces a report that discusses the challenges of the service system along with um, the successes this year, they added um, their third employee. So they now have three people um, in the office um, and they're incredibly busy. Um, and it's really become a vital part of, of the service system. There is also a uh, new office on soft direction in education. This came out of some really strong advocacy by um, family members and individuals with disabilities. Um, it is an office within our Division of Developmental Disabilities in New Jersey. And it's gonna be a place where people can learn more about self-direction. Um, and those people are you know, the, pe the people in the service system, but also the people um, at DDD. It's, a, it's an opportunity for them to learn about um, self-direction as an option in New Jersey. Um, it's an opportunity for people to um, network with others. So um, people that are self-directing and self-directing in New Jersey means um, really you know, utilizing the, the support services um, in a non kind of a non-traditional way, not necessarily, there might be a day program involved, but it might not be five days a week. There's other, um, the, they're using their, their um, Medicaid funding for, um, for different things like self-directing their, their employees and not using an agency or um, different classes that are in the community, um, things like that. So that education and that um, uh, understanding of it um, is going to, is, is, is really what the office is gonna be doing. Um, so it's really very exciting and it's um, already, um, I think that there's some movement about um, engaging people with disabilities and their, and their families and their supporters um, in, in playing some key roles in that, in that um, office. Um, the other thing that's happened is there's been a commitment to infusing person-centered planning across the, the, the service system. Um, the uh, life course tools um, 
is uh, come through a collaboration between the Bog Center, which is University Center of Excellence, the Division of Development of Disabilities, or DDD, and the Council on Development of Disabilities. They, um, they made a commitment and they've started to um, train people um, as ambassadors of, of life course tools, um, charting the life course, um, so that that becomes the vocabulary of the system so that it's, um, you know, we're, we're changing um, the way people speak about disabilities um, and the way that um, the, some of the, the, the thought processes are, are, are happening. Charting the Life Course um, framework was created to help individuals and families. Um, it's really something that can be used um, for people with all abilities and ages, and it's, it's designed to develop a vision for the good life. And that's exciting that that's becoming part of the culture of uh, DDD in New Jersey. Um, so it's, it's really designed um, to, um, you know, creating the good life, think about what they need to know and do, identify um, how to find or develop supports and discover what it takes to live the life that they wanna live. So it's not um, really about the service system first, it's about um, what the person wants to do. So next slide. Um, and this is some more good news. Um, this happened um, several years ago. Um, when I first got involved in the service system, there was a really long waiting list. Um, I'm a 2007 graduate of Partners in Policymaking. And I believe, I, I don't even wanna guess at the number. I think there was like 9,000 people on the, on the um, priority waiting list at that time for any services. And so with um, the, the, the change in, um, and the movement towards fee for service, what has come from that is two waiver programs. And one waiver program is called the supports program. And that's sort of for people that are just coming out of high school into at age 21 into the service system. And it's not, it's not a comprehensive, it's not meant to be comprehensive. It's really about what are you gonna do for your day? And we're gonna give you some money for additional supports. For people that um, rise to the level of needing of you know, being eligible for um, more of it, the institutional care, um, we have what's called the community care, care program. And there is still a wait list for that program, um, but there is, um, there is that ability to um, move now between the two waiver programs. It's not easy to do, um, but it does exist. Um, and it's, it's really still, um, still based on that need. Um, next slide. Okay. Some more good news. Um, I think the transparency, my, uh, my own personal experience um, since 2007, um, I see a tremendous shift from the leadership that we had back then to the leadership that we have now in New Jersey around this idea of transparency. Um, what are the decisions being made? Who's making them? And actually having people that it impacts um, at the table. Um, and it's, it's, it's not always perfect. It doesn't always happen. Um, but it is a lot better than it used to be. Another thing that we have um, that I'm particularly passionate about is um, each person um, in New Jersey that is eligible and receives funding through um, HCBS, through the um, Division of Development of Disabilities budget, is eligible to re receive a housing subsidy. It is a combination of the Department of Human Services and Department of Community Affairs in New Jersey, um, it's called the Supported Housing Connection, and it, it's meant to be a subsidy. Um, and it's, it is a one-bedroom one bedroom subsidy. You have to follow the published rent standard, much like you do with um, a state rental assistance voucher or um, a Section 8 voucher. Um, so you can't just rent anything, but you can rent um, anything in the community that meets the published rent standard. Um, and that really, um, there's studies around things called, um, something called Housing First, um, where people, um, you get set up with housing and then everything else in your life sort of you figure out and it, it kind of falls into place. Um, and the last um, good news is this um, new support that came in about two, three years ago called Supports Brokerage. Um, it is something that we, we provide um, and it's something as a mom of a, of a young man at age 25 that um, I'm very passionate about. I think it's the I think it's the thing in New Jersey that's going to help us um, create longevity for self-direction. It's called supports brokerage. And it's um, through person-centered planning. It's designed to help people find 
um, find self-directed services and support supports. Um, we may we assist the person and the family representative with um, tasks related to their self-directed services, such as arranging for um, uh, self-directed um, services, being a responsible employer. So in New Jersey, you have an option of being uh, an employer of record, which um, allows you to hire um, who you want to hire. You still have to follow the rules. Um, there's a there's a um, background checks and things like that, um, but it, you are able to. Um, and, and determine up to $25 an hour, you're able to determine um, uh, you know, their rate of pay. Um, that is something that we're working on in New Jersey because it's, um, it's, it's, it was determined that that was reasonable and customary, um, but there's some, some conversations around that as well. It also is about being a good employee, about making sure you have policies and procedures in place, um, that you're um, you know, understanding the responsibilities um, along with self-directing your services. Um, we also assist people in helping their employees um, correct, correctly do timesheets and um, all the, the um, notes and things that they have to do, the documentation. Um, we make sure that they understand the rules and regulations associated with self-directed services. So we're really able to um, foster that um, self-direction and, and strengthen it. We also assist a person in cultivating community connections um, through community mapping. We do community asset mapping. Um, so that's about um, who are you? What are your gifts? Um, what gifts do you want to share with your community? And then locating those in the community, making those matches. Um, we help facilitate um, circles of support, which is um, really helpful for a person that's self-directing to create that circle around them. Um, we map relationships and reciprocal relationships. And we also learn about the person's immediate and long-term needs related to self-direction. And we help identify the resources that they may be able to meet those needs. These are financial needs, housing, family, enhanced planning, and other resources. And this is really where we get to do a lot of the person-centered um, planning. Um, you know, what is important to you? What's important for you? What are your hopes and dreams? Um, what's your North Star? Like what... Um, you know, what's, um, what is it for you? Um, and we also help a person find and access natural and generic supports in their community and build that strong natural support. Um, so I think, um, you know, those are, the, those are the good things that are kind of going on in New Jersey. Um, I haven't really touched on everything. I just wanted to highlight some, um, you know, so, some general things. Um, and I think now we're ready to do some, potentially do some questions and answers. Yes, thank you so much, Jennifer, for sharing uh, all about your experiences in New Jersey and Natalie for presenting your study. Um, we are in the Q&A portion. We've gotten lots of kind of technical questions about the study um, and then some questions for um, uh, some questions for Jen as well. Um, so I will do my best to kind of group these together. And if we don't get to any questions, um, particularly some of the technical questions about the study, um, we can provide those answers in writing. We customarily do this with all of our webinars. So when we post um, the slides and the recording on our website in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll also be sure to post those answers as well. But let's see how, how many we can get to. Um, and I think Elaine, you can go ahead and just take this slideshow down now so we can, uh, so we can see each other without the presentation. Um, we received a lot of questions about the study design and results with regard to, uh, to equity. So um, I, I wanted to explore, um, you know, whether um, uh, you detected any disparities or differences related to race, ethnicity, or other characteristics, Natalie, in your study, um, but also um, maybe after Natalie shares about the study results, um, um, Jennifer, anything you might be able to touch on too, just regarding your work in advocacy in New Jersey and anything that you've observed about, um, you know, different, um, different communities um, navigating the system and, and issues of, of equitable access. So after Natalie speaks to the study results, I'd love to hear you weigh in as well, Jennifer. All right, thank you, Bevan. Uh, again, this is Natalie speaking. Um, great question. 
Um, so I did browse through some of the questions and um, I wanted to answer a, a few technical things first. Somebody asked um, why there was not a group, um, sorry, why there was not a race category for Asians. And that was because um, just for sample size issues, we collapsed um, some of the smaller groups into a single category. Um, and then, so I did present um, a slide looking at that summarized, excuse me, the demographic characteristics um, related to unmet need. So in our study, interestingly enough, we did find that all of the um, non-white uh, respondents had greater likelihood of having at least one unmet need. Um, but in the multivariate analysis, that relationship between race and some of the negative outcomes was flipped. Um, so there is a really uh, there is a link between um, race and race and ethnicity and uh, likelihood of having unmet need in our data. And I would imagine this is Bevan. I would imagine Natalie that um, like any good study, um, your results um, sort of bring up more you know, more questions that we need to explore in the future, right? More yeah. understanding. So um, it sounds like, you know, one of the things that you're saying is that there were some relationships there and it would be great to dive deeper into the relationship between, uh, or the, the how if unmet need and relationship between unmet need and outcomes is different by race. So more yes. studies. And, and finer grain so that we can see, you know, is it different for Asians? Is it different for, for member, different different Asian American communities, right? Because of course, right. that's one very diverse group itself. Um, right. Definitely a challenge um, in many uh, administrative and survey data um, sources that breaking down into finer groups presents some methodological challenges. Um, but um, yeah, thanks. Jennifer, would you like to speak to, to this topic uh, from, from your own experience? Um, in terms of how different... So um, I think, I think I, I, you know, being that you, you know, have been working and advocating for, you know, better access to home and community services for decades, um, you know, have you observed any um, any issues related to to equity in terms of in terms of race, in terms of geography, in terms of people's ability to afford? Uh, and you mentioned, you know, people's ability to afford a, an attorney uh, for hearings. You know, um, that yeah. in itself to me seems like sure. one key area. Yeah. In terms of equity, I think one of the things that I've noticed is that if a person has a strong um, strong natural supports. Right, so um, family around them that's able to um, negotiate and and make, um, you know, so so there's people that I, that we support where their families one person doesn't work, right, and their primary responsibility is to care for the person with a disability, so they act as a primary caregiver. Um, so the, right there, you have a socioeconomic situation, right? Not everybody can afford to have you know, in my own family, both people and, you know, my husband and wife, we're both working, right? So um, in order for one person to be able to not work or have it, have it be sort of a, um, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work, self-direction in New Jersey, you know, it's a lot of work. And so, so it's, it's navigating, it's networking, it's, it's making sure that, um, you know, people show up um, when they say they're going to show up. It's um, making sure that things are getting paid. It's, you know, we have a, um, uh, you know, a system of fiscal intermediary in New Jersey and people spend a lot of time navigating that system, making sure that, they're, that their employees get paid. Um, so there's a lot of um, things about this system about that are, are time consuming. Um, so if you don't have that person in your life, right? You're, you're you know, we have a support broker, right? And we, we do the best we can, but, it's, it's really, um, again, then you become, it's another dependency on the system. Yeah, 
Yeah, and we're getting uh, endorsements of this. Uh, Jennifer in chat that self direction is a full time job um, uh, in in New Jersey and I think uh, in many other states as well. It is it is a full time job, and I think that um, I think you know support brokers. We need to keep strengthening it. I think one of the things that we're talking about in New Jersey is for it to be a support for when the natural supports are no longer able to be. Um, to be there for, the, for their loved one, right? So we're going to carry those stories and we're going to carry the, um, the hopes and dreams of um, the parents and the, and the siblings um, when they're not there anymore. Um, and we're, we're working on it becoming, um, a, you know, a greater, a greater support in that regard. Um, I think that, you know, an, another th challenge that we have is for people that in New Jersey that may have um, a dual diagnosis, so um, whether it's, um, you know, a severe medical um, challenge on top of a developmental disability, psychiatric on top, anytime you complicate that, um, then that's a whole nother level of, and that doesn't, that doesn't discriminate um, rural, you know, urban, race, socioeconomic, it, it, it makes it, um, you know, they're, they're, you can't have more than one waiver in New Jersey. Right? I think that's a rule across this, across the country. But you know, when you have that need and you need to access multiple waivers, um, and you can't, um, you know, that's a that's another tricky issue that we have. Um, this brings me actually to another set of questions, Natalie, that we received, which was, um, you know, can you speak to, uh, so, so you used national core indicators for aging and disability data. There is a national core indicator survey that um, focuses on uh, intellectual developmental disability systems. Um, uh, is there a particular reason that this study focused on NCI AD uh, data? Yes. Um, great. Thanks, Bevan. Um, I actually wanted to touch on that, too, that actually NCIAD, so the Aging and Disabilities version of NCI, um, is relatively new compared to the decades, over a decade, um, long implementation of the NCI survey. So the NCI survey focuses on the developmental, um, the IDD population. So there is a a long history of data being collected in that population. Um, I'm not entirely sure um, about the history of at what point um, HSRI decided that they wanted to survey this other population. Um, maybe somebody from HSRI could fill in the gaps, but from my understanding, it seems like um, there just had not been enough studies in the, in the adult, general adult population. Um, and then also, um, because, because the survey really relies on states and selecting specific Medicaid programs, some of these programs are focused on, um, you know, those with physical disabilities and older adults and then the IDD population separately. So I think some of that is a function of how programs are structured in general. Um, Let's see, what other things can I note? Um, so I wanna note that our, within the NCIAD uh, survey uh, sample, there are individuals who do have um, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, the exact percentage, there is a table in the NCIAD uh, report that is produced by HSRI. Um, I think we can link that, um, but you'll be able to see the breakdown there. Um, so it's not exclusive of people with IDD, but that is not the focus um, of the of the sample that we studied. Thanks, Natalie. Um, and yes, so the Human Services uh, Research Institute, where Alex and Sasha and Elaine and I work, um, that houses NCAPS, uh, does also uh, work on both the National Core Indicators and the National Core Indicators for Aging and Disability uh, surveys with our partners at. Uh, the National Association of State Developmental Disabilities Directors, um, I might have gotten that acronym wrong, pardon me, uh, and Advancing States for NCIAD. Um, and um, so we will be sure for a lot of these questions, we'll also sort of um, provide written responses. But I think 
you know, th there were there were some other questions too. You know, what about people with co-occurring developmental disabilities and mental health conditions? You know, um, uh, just just ensure you know, because I, I think we could all imagine, and and the folks on this webinar uh, represent a lot of different you know work or live or or. or um, have lived experience with uh, a lot of different service systems that provide services for a lot of different diagnoses or disability identities. So, um, you know, I think for one thing to say would be that I think it's, it would be a worthwhile um, endeavor to study the relationship between unmet needed outcomes for all of these populations. Um, this was just a start using a, a, a newer data set um, for a population that hadn't yet um, we, where we hadn't yet explored these. So, um, okay, let's see. I, I'd be interested, um, Jennifer, if you could um, say just a bit more, you've spoken a lot already about self-direction. It's quite timely uh, because NCAPS is just launching this month, uh, our self-direction learning collaborative. Um, and we're very excited to be working with 23 teams from 16 states to engage in uh, shared learning um, and uh, to use quality improvement principles to uh, improve the quality access uh, and access uh, uh, to self-direction in their respective states. So um, I'm sure we'll do a webinar on that uh, as we get further along. Um, so this is a topic that is incredibly important to us at NCAPS and really is, you know, self-direction in many ways is the quintessential person-centered practice uh, when implemented properly. Um, so you, you've spoken a lot about this already, Jennifer, but I wonder if you could just say maybe just a bit more and if you have like an example um, uh, of how, self-direction could possibly uh, address these unmet needs that we're, you know, that we've identified or associated with, with negative outcomes for folks. Sure. Well, I think um, this whole idea of, of a waiver, right, came out of um, a person's uh, desire to, um, you know, sort of take the money and, and do it themselves, right, for very simplistic terms. Um, the, the, you know, the Katie Beckett waiver was about, um, you know, a, a person that m met the uh, level of institutional care and really just wanted to take the money and to, and to do it themselves. And I think the more control of the money that we give to the people with disabilities and, and their families and their supporters um, and really let them control how the funds are spent, obviously with with some guidelines and some and some, you know, rules around it, like we're not buying, you know, season tickets to the Giants games, but, you know, we're, we're, you know, we know what we, what we need, right? And the more we can keep focusing it back on the person and what they want and what they, you know, when, when, you know, I don't view my son with a disability as a burden. It's, I, I don't mean to sound that way, but I didn't have those hopes and dreams for him that he would one day, you know, have the disability that he had, right? I had other hopes and dreams for him. And if we figure out a way to make sure that we're, we're, we always have those in the forefront and we're, and we're playing, you know, with that um, and giving back the flexibility and understanding the responsibility. Um, you know, I think that's a, a good step in the, in, in, in the right direction. Um, I think where it gets complicated is, is, you know, obviously we have to make sure that the system, there's equity for all and, and access for all and that, we're not, <clears throat> it's not the people that are the most vocal or the people that are, you know, that, that are able to spend the time to get their needs met. Um, but I think we do need to go back to, you know, um, for example, like in New Jersey, we have, we, I talked about those three, those three buckets that we have. We actually have, there's four. Um, one of them is, is employment and day. And then the second one is called the supports, um, supports portion of the budget. The third is residential, if you have the community care program. And then the fourth one, since we are a workforce state, is employment, um, additional employment services if needed, right? So um, supports brokerage comes out of the smallest budget, the, serve, the um, support budget, support portion of the budget. Um, and um, sometimes we run into situations with people where they run out of funding in that area. Um, and so, you know, and they need, they still need our help. 
right? They don't have the natural supports that maybe they, 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 they can take over the things that we do. Um, and so we have, we have decisions to make. How do we, how do we handle that, right? So having the ability to, to take funding from one area when um, you don't need employment in day or you don't need as much employment day as you need in some of the other areas or residential, you wanna move some of that to employment in day. Um, having that ability to really manipulate the money um, in, in a meaningful, mindful way, I think is, um, is part of the answer. Thanks. Thanks. And thank you, Natalie, for putting uh, links to the study itself uh, into chat. Um, for folks who haven't seen it, you can, um, you can get the abstract of the study if you click on the link. Um, and then you could also just email Natalie if you'd like a PDF of the study. And also Finn Gardner, who um, uh, had, had an unexpected issue and wasn't able to make it to this panel today, authored um, a brief that really summarizes the study and puts it into, you know, kind of a more accessible, less academic format. Um, and I highly encourage everyone to download that and take a look. It's a, it's a really um, uh, a masterpiece in translating some complex research findings into really compelling, uh, a compelling data story. Um, and uh, we will, by the way, you know, make sure Finn has the option to, to be able to provide some reflections and um, answers to these questions and provide any of his other thoughts in writing and provide that to you all um, after the fact too, because I know he wanted to be here. Um, all right, great. Let's see. I um, would like, let's see, where do I want to go next? Yeah, so, um, uh, First of all, uh, Natalie, can you remind us of the time period for this study? Um, and um, and asking because I'd like to, to talk about, you know, whether and how these results might have changed uh, with, with, you know, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this data is from the 2017-2018 round of NCIAD. Um, but just to clarify, that's only, it's only one year of data. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head the dates of data collection, um, but it spans that time. And I know that um, because of the pandemic, NCIAD survey team has been piloting a remote version of the survey. Um, and I'm not sure if results from that are ready yet. Oh, no, they are. There is a report. Um, on the pilot for the remote version of the study. Um, and I believe that came about because of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and that's my understanding as well. Um, I don't work on the NCI work, but I do know that my colleagues um, at, you know, working on the NCI team uh, very quickly worked to find ways for the NCI surveys to be administered remotely by video conference and phone. Um, piloted that previously they were uh, done in person, um, had piloted that and um, uh, those, those data are coming in. So another future study, Natalie, would be to see if these unmet needs, um, you know, widened uh, or what happened during the pandemic and um, did the relationship between unmet needs and outcomes change. Um, when the whole rest of the world changed. And I don't know, Jennifer, if you have any reflections from your own experience in New Jersey on, you know, just the impact of the pandemic, uh, particularly, I guess, on, you know, I mean, of course it had an impact, right? Um, but if we're thinking about what, what, you know, unmet needs resulted in poor outcomes for people before the pandemic, during the pandemic, was there any difference in whether and how and that needs resulted in more. Um, yeah, um, definitely, definitely have some some um, feedback around that. I think some of the things that we learned through the pandemic um, is that, or, or that um, people with disabilities don't necessarily need. Um, so, so people that were going to day programs, um, some people realized that um, that may or may not be the best um, setting for them. Um, and some of that came up in that um, there were behaviors or, or different things that were going on when they went to the day program and not having access to the day program. Um, they were able to explore other parts of their lives and 
you know, they had to explore other parts of their lives because they didn't have access to that service. And they made them, I think, made some people realize that um, that they, you know, didn't didn't want to go back to that, that they wanted to create. So we were able to help people, other some people create some unday program day programs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so un, you know, um, unprogrammed programs um, around customizing their day. So that was something that came up. Um, another thing that I think that came up was that it gave people without disabilities an opportunity to experience um, isolation. Um, uh, uh, the lack of ability to, you know, to kind of jump in the car and go to the grocery store, right? And and to um, get a sense of what it may be like to have to plan every single little aspect of your life um, around basic needs. Um, I was fortunate enough, um, I have a person that we support who um, happened to be on the, um, on the, on the evening news um, in early in the uh, early in the um, in the pandemic, um, and and the, the reporter asked about that, right? And the answer sort of was like, "This is what it is. This is what it feels like, you know." And and we really need to take more time to create the, the I, I say the places and the spaces, right, where people can show up and share their gifts. Um, so I think that that was another thing that happened, um, and. It also came very apparent on how much people rely on natural supports and how we really need to um, provide respite for caregivers and, and take better care of the caregivers. Mm. Um, so those are some things that we learned. Um, I have one more question. And if other folks have questions, um, please do continue to put in the chat. We have a little more time together. Um, I'd like to... Um, to, and thank you, Natalie, for including some more detail in chat as well. I think some of the some of the technical answers are really useful to have in writing. Um, so please do check out chat for that, folks, if you'd like, and they'll be um, they'll be in the summary later on as well. Um, so Jennifer, I'd like to uh, have you say a little bit more about um, the role of advocates in this picture. Um, you know, I, I I appreciated the way that you you know you you critiqued you know, some of the flaws uh, or the challenges and barriers to receiving, you know, to having met needs and with home and community-based services in New Jersey. And you also identified a lot of positives um, and a lot of um, sort of exciting new directions. Um, and, you know, for yourself, um, as someone who's advocated for your own family and then through, you know, the work that you do, it, it, you know, there's some advocacy component in the sports corporate work that you do. Can you share a bit about your thoughts on the role of advocacy in um, strengthening home and community-based service systems? Sure. Um, I guess it kind of goes back to, you know, nothing about us without us, right? That idea of, um, you know, we need to put to, um, to, to voice, to paper, to communicate in any way we can um, what the needs are, um, what, um, you know, how we want to live our lives um, for people with disabilities, um, how they want to live their lives, what is it, what they want to accomplish, because they, they're not, um, I don't know that they're being heard in, in that regard, um, but advocacy is extremely important, and it can be, you know, as, as simple as making sure that the person that comes um, to provide you with care is, is providing you with care the way that you want um, to be, have it provided, right? It can be about meeting with your local, um, you know, your local legislators within, within your state. It can be about sharing an experience that you've had with them. Um, it can be about figuring out, um, you know, who the, who the key players are at the state level that are making the decisions and, and get their email addresses, you know, get um, and, and provide feedback on, on things that are happening. Um, it's about networking. Um, it's about figuring out within within advocacy, um, you know, who's who and 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 strengthening each other, right? So, you know, if if you if there's things that come up that maybe you're not 100 percent passionate about, but you can lend a voice to it, lend that voice to it, strengthen that for that person because you know it's 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 in numbers, right? It's it's a numbers game. The, the more people we have saying, you know, we need better access to, to the to the funding. We need we need 
um, the unmet needs, right? The transportation, for example, is such an amazing, um, I, it really struck me in that slide, right? That, that Natalie had is um, unmet need for transportation was associated with the lowest likelihood of being active in the community and interacting with friends and family. Like if, if everybody just calls up their local legislator tonight, right? And I don't care if they're state, federal, I, I don't care if it's at the county freeholders or the uh, whatever your, your state has at the county level, Call them up and tell them that. You know, there's research now. And the research says, if we don't get our act together with transportation, we have the lowest, and, and, and people with disabilities have so much to contribute to their community. So you're missing out on a whole voice, a whole group of people. So, you know, take some, take some talking points from this study and, and go talk to the people that make the decisions about it and, and talk to each other about it. Post it on Facebook. You know, get in those Facebook groups that people have. We used to have Yahoo mail groups. We don't have that many more, but <laughs> that's how old I am. Um, you know, talk to each other and share this, share this research. Um, you know, that's that's how we get it done. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to um, just offer each of you, Natalie and Jennifer, just to you know, another minute or two to provide any closing remarks and, and then I'll wrap this up. Natalie, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, thank you so much for listening to the presentation and I'm glad that there was so much interest um, in the paper. Um, and of course, it was great to also be on a panel with Jen who provides such a um, unique and different perspective outside of the research and academic setting that I'm used to. So I've definitely learned a lot through you too. Well, thanks, Natalie. I'm, I'm in reading your research. Um, I'm not an academic. <laughs> um, I found it, um, it's really important and I'm, I really appreciate it that you took the time to do it and that, um, that you're looking at this information in a slightly different way that's it's never been looked at this way before. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate NCAPS for having these webinars, for, um, for allowing me the opportunity to really dive into this topic. Um, I did a lot of preparation for this and um, had a lot of conversations with different people from different perspectives across New Jersey. Um, and that that's really fueled a little bit of some, um, you know, some interest around, around this topic. Um, I think we need to just keep talking to each other and, and sharing this information. And um, I don't know, just keep showing up for these webinars, right? <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Natalie. When we first, um, you know, had the idea for this webinar, you know, we thought we this is this is such important research. We want to highlight it, um, but because we're not a research group, um, and because our audience is, you know, people out in the real world um, who care about person-centered practices and want to advance them forward, how can we bring this research to life with personal stories and information? Um, and, and, and really tell, tell the story using the numbers, but also using words and, and narrative. And, 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 um, and so I, I, I thank you both for helping us to, to bring those two pieces together um, so that we could tell this story in a, in a little richer detail. Uh, one key takeaway for me is just how much more research is needed. Um, I saw on chat there's some folks doing some qualitative research on race, racial and ethnic disparities um, in, in unmet need and home and community-based services. How exciting. Um, there's a lot more to explore in the National Core Indicators data. There's a lot more to explore um, in, in everyone's work. So uh, for the researchers on the call, let's keep going. Let's keep exploring these critical questions. Let's apply that equity lens. Um, let's really dig into this and help uh, to understand um, so that advocates like Jennifer and so hundreds uh, here can use those numbers um, and work both within state systems, if you're working in state systems, uh, in your roles as leaders, in your roles as advocates to really move this forward so that we can um, we can advance uh, a good life and the opportunity for a good life for everybody. So thanks everybody for all that you do. Um, we have uh, just a closing wrap up. I'd love it if folks could stay on for one moment and take an evaluation of this webinar. 
Um, there are a few questions. Let's see, I think there's six questions. So just scroll down. If you could leave us your evaluation before you leave, that would be great. We use these, uh, the responses to these surveys to improve our webinars in the future. Um, and we are always uh, open to hearing your ideas and suggestions about how we can improve, how we can be more useful, how we can be more accessible. Uh, we're open to all of your feedback. Thanks to everybody for your time today, for your, uh, your discussion this afternoon. And uh, we'll see you next month.